She used to do these rosary rallies herself. She would come out. She was down in Long Beach, <clears throat> all over the country. And now she sends us out, as long as we last. And then we'll <laughs> send younger people. We'll send these young people out, and they'll do the Rosary Congress because you are so important. We, we, are, we are so happy to be back in California. Mm. My you, husband's all choked up. So you, are, you are like gold. Every one of you, every single face is so important to us and to our church. We're just so excited to be back here again. And I think what I'd like you to do, just so that you can see what we see, it's really important that you see the you that we see, everybody, on everybody right now, to look at the person on your right. Just sneak a peek. Look at the person on your right, even if you don't know them. But no kissing. No kissing. Okay, a little kissing. <laughs> now, did everybody look at the person on their right? What you saw was a unique, one-of-a-kind creation of God. That person, that individual creation that you saw was something that God molded and created. And when he was finished creating it, he looked at you and he said, you are beautiful. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. Praise you Jesus. are beautiful. So if you think you're too tall or too short or too fat or too thin, you got straight hair or curly hair or no hair, just remember that when God created you, he said, it is fine, it is beautiful. They are beautiful. And that's how we see you. We see you in the light of Jesus, and you are so beautiful. You know, uh, for Bob and me and Luz Elena and Brother Joseph, for our community, this is very, very special. You know that we have been Californians for 25 years, and we will always be Californians. And we love you dearly. And we've been hearing so much bad news about the church in the United States. And I tell you, we tell you, the church is alive. We are the majority. Don't let anyone tell you that we're the minority. We are not. We are the majority. The only problem... You did good, honey. <laughs> the only problem that we've got is that we are intimidated by a small minority of big mouths. And we have been intimidated and we've allowed ourselves to be intimidated, but I see nothing but good things happening here in California, in We're the so church excited. in California. We have heard that there are new bishops coming in, there are new priests coming in, they're cleaning house, they're taking all the liberals, throwing them out, bringing back <laughs> the traditions of our church. This is happening here in California. We you have got to take your place in the church. You must take your place in the church. And that's what we're here to stoke you up. We're here to get you so excited, you're going to run out of here and you're going to take part in the church because that's what we have to do. We are standing on holy ground. Do you realize that the state of California has been consecrated? There is not a, a city, there is not a village that is not named after a saint. Sacramento, the blessed sacrament. Except Bakersfield. <laughs> well, hey, wait a minute. The bread of life right here, Bakersfield. Praise you, Jesus. But this is consecrated ground. This ground was consecrated by the Franciscans. Every inch of it, there is a battle going on between God and Satan, has always been. And so we have to be the, the turning power, the turning force in the church. You know, I'm sure we've told you this before, somebody else may have that. Statistically, by the year 2000, there will be six billion people on Earth. And of those six billion people, two-thirds will never have heard the name Jesus. Two-thirds, four billion people will never have heard the name of Jesus. Our Pope has been desperately trying to turn the tables. He has a program called Evangelization 2000. Many of you may have heard of it. It's in Mexico. It's in all the South American countries as well as Europe, 
but we haven't really clicked with it here in the United States, but this program is to turn the table so that in the year 2000, there will be more people who have heard the name of Jesus than who haven't. And how do we do that? We get up off our duffs, we get out into the streets, and we proclaim the name of Jesus. Catholics have to become evangelists. We have to become evangelists. And it's fun because when you go into the streets and you proclaim the name of Jesus and they say, the Catholic Church has never evangelized, well, now it's our turn. Well, that's what we, by our baptism, we are called to evangelization. Our Lord Jesus came on this earth. God sent his only begotten son. Our Lord came. Our Lord was born to die for us. Has he died in vain? Has he died in vain? I say no, and you say no. We want, to, we want to tell you about a little boy in Mexico. He has not as yet been beatified, but his cause is open for beatification. You know, there were 25 Mexican martyrs who were beatified three years ago, in 1992. How many of you have heard of them? Has anybody heard of those? 25 Mexican well, martyrs. Well, you're going to. 15 of the 25 were from the seminary at Guadalajara in Mexico. Now, they're still coming up with more and more oh, people there were hundreds of who thousands. were victims in the 1920s of the Mason government in Mexico. And Penny's going to start cheering a little bit about one brave person, 10 years old. The only thing that we'd like to just preempt that with the Mexican people are holy, stubborn people. We have a daughter. They have the gift of holy stubbornness. The Irish, the Polish, and the Mexicans have a tremendous gift the Lord gave them of holy stubbornness. You got to kill them before they'll give up their church. Praise you, Jesus. Viva! Viva! Come on, everybody. Viva! Viva! Viva. Viva Cristo Rey! Viva! Viva Cristo! Viva! Viva Cristo Rey! Everyone, viva! 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 Viva Cristo Rey! Viva! This is what it's all about. They would tell us that he is not What happened? What, you don't want Penny to speak anymore? Is that it? She's out? That's all right. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get her back. You talk to this. They would tell us that the Lord is not in our presence. Okay, now just don't touch this anymore. <laughs> Do we have another one? <laughs> Let's see. Sure, go ahead. I give them a mention. Are they active? Well, Bob's doing that. In Mexico, when the Masons took over, they went to our priests and our bishops. They didn't ask them to deny Christ. No, they were much more subtle and deadly. They said, we want you to start a, can we? Yeah. We want you to, to start a state church. And every priest, with the exception of three, and every single bishop made the decision to become outlaws rather than join the state church because they knew what they wanted. The only way that you can control the Mexican people is through the Catholic Church. The only way, Constantine knew it in the third century, the only way that you can control the world is through the Catholic Church. So what is happening today, you can, you're not active? No. We're going to have to share. Okay. So what they're trying to do today is to take over the church. But we have never been so educated, we in the laity, as we are today. 
And because of perpetual Eucharistic adoration, which means Jesus truly present in our midst, we will win the church and keep the church for our Pope, for our Blessed Mother, and our Lord Jesus. Now, we started to tell you about this little Mexican boy. He was 10 years old, and he had a sombrero. And on his sombrero, he had written out, Viva Cristo Rey. And on the other side was, Y la Virgen de Guadalupe, which is Our Lady of Guadalupe. Now, at that time, it was illegal to practice your faith belief in Mexico. This is only, what, 70 years ago. It's not that long ago. And if they wanted to find a Catholic Mexican, the soldiers would go up to somebody and say, Quien vive? It means who lives? And the natural answer is, Viva Cristo Rey. And when they would do that, they would shoot them. And that's how they would get rid of the Catholics. So this little 10-year-old has got a big sombrero, and on it he's got Viva Cristo Rey. And, and the Generale comes in to town. The late, you gotta come on. The latest thug. And with, with his, his band of guerrillas, and he says to the young boy, don your hat, out of respect. The little boy says, well, I'm not gonna don my hat to you. He says, you don your hat or I'll beat you up. Meanwhile, the people of the village got so panicky, they ran to the father. And they said to him, do something with your son. He's, he's in trouble here. And the father came to the boy and he said, don your hat to the soldiers. What's, it's no big deal. You don't have to mean it. Just don your hat. And the little boy said, Papa, I can understand them asking that of me. But you, my father, you asked me to don my hat. And he did not. And they shot him. Do we believe that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist? Do we believe? They died for it. Do you believe? Are you willing to die for the Eucharist? Are you willing to live for the Eucharist? Then Jesus is here. He is present. He is alive. And he's in full charge of which church? The, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. That's who we are. Oh, they're, coming, they're coming with another microphone. Yay! What a guy. Let's see if it works. I'll take back the hug. <laughs> see if it, try it. Let's see if it works. Now I don't have okay. to take back the hug. We want to share with you today about miracles of the Eucharist. But before we can share with you about miracles of the Eucharist, we have to share the great miracle of the Eucharist, that which took place 2,000 years ago, that which our church is built upon, the rock upon which our church is built. Our Lord Jesus in Capernaum shared with the bread, the bread of the doctrine of the bread of life. And he said to the people, where's our books? He said, I myself, this is John 6, 51, I myself am the living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. At this, the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, how can he give us his flesh to eat? Thereupon Jesus said to them, I solemnly assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now you have to remember, before you make judgments about the Jews, and Jesus knew the law, didn't he? Jesus said, I have come not to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. He knew the law, and he knew what they were thinking. He even said to them, is this too hard for you to bear? Now, no Orthodox Jew till today will eat meat that has any blood in it at all. They soaked their meat or they salt their meat, and they did in the time of Jesus. And this now, he's no longer the Messiah. They call him now the Nazarene. This Nazarene is proposing that they drink human blood. Now, he is proposing that they eat human flesh. Now, in the Judean hills, 
they were practicing cannibalism. What did they think? They thought cannibalism. Do we not have brothers and sisters who tell us that if we believe that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist, we're cannibals? Well, let me tell you, why didn't Jesus say, I didn't mean eat my body and drink my blood? I'm gone again. I can't believe, okay. Because what happened, what accomplished was, they turned around and walked away from them. All of them. Now, my little Italian wife, if you were to get up, if we were to say something, and all of a sudden everybody would get up and start to head out the door, her little feet would run up the aisle, chicka chicka chick, block the aisle with her body and not let you leave. She would you say might to you, me, but... wait a minute, you misunderstood me. I didn't mean eat my body and drink my blood. It's semantics, it's just an expression, it's a symbol. But he didn't say that. He watched them leave. He let them leave. He even turned to the 12th. The 12th. And Jesus had an urgency. Don't we hear that? Every moment to Jesus was important. And Jesus loved these people. Don't think he wanted the Jews to walk out on him. They, he was born of them. They were the chosen people. But he could not say it's a symbol because that would have been a lie. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. He could not because it's not true. Jesus is the Eucharist. Jesus is present in the Eucharist. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so he turned to his apostles and he said, will you leave me also? He was he, ready to let them go. He would have let everybody go. So this is how important it was to Jesus. This doctrine, this Eucharist that many of us take so for granted. Do you know that Mother, and Mother Teresa, who in, our, in our documentary, she was interviewed and she said that she gave uh, credit to most of the vocations that she gets to the Eucharist. Do you know that the other day, maybe two weeks ago, she was interviewed. Do you know how many nuns she's got today? 27,000 nuns. And she gives credit to the Eucharist. Mother Angelica, who cannot now, she has, so, she has a convent that was built for 15. She has 29 nuns in there. And now she has to get a farm because there are so many young women, beautiful young women, the fairest of our country, who want to join her order. And what is her order? They are cloistered nuns whose charism is perpetual Eucharistic adoration. That's what they do. That's, that's really what they do. The, the nuns, at, uh, ED, they're not at EWTN, they're at the convent, Our Lady of the Angels Monastery. They. 24 hours a day, perpetual Eucharistic adoration of our Lord Jesus. That's what it's all about. Now look at this. His Mother Angelica, Mother Teresa. We have been, we haven't been to the Pope's ch private chapel, but we have been to the private chapels of many bishops and cardinals. And we know that Bishop Sheen, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, who many of you young people don't know, I'm finding <laughs> this out. It's terrible. Ooh. We're getting old, folks. What I say to the we Archbishop. We've got to spread the good news. They don't know who he is. Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen was the first television evangelist, the first one. And he would go in front of the Blessed Sacrament in the chapel, and all the scripts for his television programs were done right there in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel. Now, if all these people see the power of Eucharist adoration, why can't we? Why don't we understand how important it is? Our dear Lord felt that it was so important. He gave us at the Last Supper, he not only gave us his body, blood, soul, and divinity, he gave us the vessels, the means by which we would receive our Lord and we would be changed. And he gave us the priesthood. So he gave us the Eucharist at the Last Supper and he gave us the priesthood by which we could continue down through the centuries to have the Eucharist. And so that priesthood has been what? Under attack from the very beginning. One day I was really down in the dumps and I thought, oh my Lord, it's the end of the church. And this wonderful priest who's a convert to the faith said, listen, Penny, it's been going on for 2,000 years and we beat it every time. 
and we're still here. I didn't know that. Not only that, but we were told by church historians that if it were not for the Eucharist, the church would not have lasted the first 100 years. Only the power of Jesus in the Eucharist has brought us through these 2,000 years. Now, he knew that. Now, I said to you, it's always been the priesthood. Always attack the priesthood. And we see what's happening today, don't we? How dare they attack our priests with filth on the movie screens? How dare they put out anything like the priests? I am fit to be tied. Any, do you know how many hundreds of thousands of Mexicans died alongside their priests because they were hiding their priests, they were defending their priests? And we as Americans allow them to put something like that on the screen? They want to attack our priests. Do you know why? They don't care about the priests. They care about the sheep. They don't We're care about the sheep. They don't care about destroying the priests. They want to destroy us, the church. And the only way they can do it is to destroy or discredit the priesthood. Okay, we have to continue with our miracles. Okay, years. now. We're now, getting off the subject. In the year 700, the priesthood was under attack. Always under attack. Okay. And there was a heresy spread. I mean, it started from the beginning, these heresies against the Eucharist, against the Blessed Mother, against the divinity of Christ, began right from the beginning. And so at this time, it was widespread amongst the bishops and the priests that Jesus was not truly present in the Eucharist. They would say things like, well, it's okay for them. They need that as a crutch. But you and we, we're too intelligent. We, we know, know better. We know it's not true. We know that Jesus doesn't come to us body and blood, soul and divinity during the, the consecration of the Mass. And so this dear priest who really believed, he had, he had believed so much and struggled so hard with this belief, he did the only thing he knew how to do. He prayed. He prayed that the faith that he was given on the day of his ordination, the gift that we were given at the Last Supper, that Jesus truly comes to us body and blood, soul and divinity during the consecration of the Mass was true. And so on this one day, as he began the concert, he started the Mass for the people of the town of Lanciano. As he raised the host in consecration, the host turned into flesh. Real flesh. Human flesh. Human flesh. Flesh from the heart. The blood turned into real blood, human blood. <clears throat> the blood type of the flesh and the blood are the same blood type, AB, which is the same blood type <clears throat> as the Shroud of Turin, by the way. The priest shook. He turned around to the people of the town completely they were completely shocked when they saw what happened. He claimed, he told them out of how he had disbelieved and how the Lord had given him this miracle to confound his disbelief. The people in the church went down on their knees. They started yelling out confessions. They thought it was the end of the world. They started running out of the church to tell the people of the town. Now, do we have any Italians here? Any Italians? No Italians, huh? Okay. okay. Oh, a couple of Italians. We need right. some of you because okay. I'm just about to get a shot. Now, here's the deal. <laughs> Let me explain. You tell one Italian something, you tell the whole world. <laughs> Boy, you know, zing, it's all. Well, Mother Angelica. Oh, Mother Angelica. Perfect example. You tell her something, the whole world knows about it in 20 minutes. <laughs> so these people ran outside the when church she's tired. into the town and they shared this miracle of the Eucharist that had taken place with everybody and before you know it people were coming from all over Italy and then all over Europe to venerate this miracle of the Eucharist 